enjoy. And thank you so much, Jillian, for joining us online tonight. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, um, Jess, and the, the Chelmsford Library. I'm so excited to be with you all on this uh, chilly Monday night. So hopefully uh, everyone is drinking something exciting. And please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, more than happy to take them as we go or save them for the end. It's designed to be sort of an interactive talk. So the more questions, the better. Um, but as Jess said, I'm a certified sommelier. My name is Jillian Katz. Um, and I'm really excited to be here tonight. So first off, um, what is a sommelier? Sort of a big fancy French word that really just means uh, a wine expert certified by the Court of Master Sommeliers. So if anyone's looking for further research, I know you're in the right place with the library, but um, there are some amazing documentaries about the process of becoming specifically a master sommelier, which is the fourth level um, there are, I'm the second of four, so I still have a long way to go in my wine knowledge journey, um, but there's the, the process of becoming certified includes things like a written exam, um, blind tasting, and proper service of wine, so um, it's a pretty fun documentary to watch. I think there are a few now um, available, maybe on Amazon or through the library. Um, they're called SOM, and then the second one is about wine making and wine tasting, which we'll hopefully touch on later tonight. Um, it's called SOM into the bottle. So if you have more questions about what it means to be a sommelier, there are plenty of resources, or I'm happy to answer any questions about that later too. So tonight's agenda, um, we're going to talk about the basics of wine making, uh, go into wine tasting, talk about a few flavor profiles and some common grape varietals, uh, go through a couple of pairing rules, and I put together a few suggestions for some fun holiday items that might be on your menu this month, um, and then plenty of time for questions, both as we go and, and at the end. So feel free to jot those in the chat. Uh, so first, Wine 101. Uh, the cool thing about wine is that it actually grows around the world in all climates. So in the map on the left, you can see um, both wine, uh, warm climates and cool, both produce amazing wine varietals. Um, and you can grow wine anywhere as warm as like the, right along the equator, all the way to creating ice wine and um, sort of some fun dessert varietals coming out of Canada or Iceland, um, really cool climates. And the climate has a big impact on the wine and the what it tastes like in the bottle. So um, wine has this concept called terroir, which really just translates to the taste of place. Um, meaning that the wine that's produced ends up having sort of characteristics that come with um, the climate, the soil, um, the weather conditions of the place in which it was grown. Um, and they all contribute to sort of that um, flavor and, and sort of the, the profile of the wine. So um, that could be something like the old versus new world. Sometimes different countries or different producers have different methodology for um, producing wine or things that they design within the wine as a product. Um, the second could just be like, what does the, the land taste like? What is it formatted around? So um, maybe it's really mountainous. You get sort of a cool morning with a warm afternoon. Um, all those things really contribute to the output. Um, and the, the winemakers are pretty particular about where they grow and how they grow their grapes um, in order to produce that sort of ideal output for their region. The other cool thing I'll say about um, the concept of terroir is that it really allows you to understand that like a culture and a climate or uh, like a culture of that place. So um, if you're growing wine in Italy, for example, uh, sometimes like they design culture and cuisine around that sort of region as well. You can sort of taste the characteristics of the land without really having to travel um, and sort of get out of your house. You can just open a bottle of wine uh, and try something a little new. So it's a fun way to sort of travel from home. I know we all were doing a lot of that over the last few years, um, both without leaving our houses, but also probably drinking a lot of wine. So uh, it's sort of a fun way to experience something new um, and get outside of maybe your, your comfort zone of what you always pick up at the store. Um, so the, the winemaking process is at its core, like an agricultural farming process, which is kind of crazy. 
Because when you pick up a bottle of wine in a liquor store, you rarely think about the fact that it was a farmer who made it. Um, but it is made from grapes. Um, if you've visited a vineyard, it looks a lot like this photo on the right. Hopefully on a sunny day, um, you can see that the grapes are grown in rows. Um, the vines sort of come up from this stalk in the ground and fan out and they they make sure that they're they're pretty manicured. Um, some climates and regions allow you to irrigate. So there'll be sort of a constant supply of water to feed the grapes um, and hopefully some good sunshine. Although too much is not a good thing either. So the grapes can be fickle. Um, they tend to sort of root down into the soil um, and pull any moisture out of the ground, which is really great, especially in some of those warmer climates where they might be experiencing drought. Um, but otherwise they're, they're pretty hardy um, they can survive a lot and they're, they produce some really amazing flavors. So the process is really three main parts. The first is the harvest. So grapes have grown for months and months and months. We've actually just finished harvest now, um, but they're picked, sorted, and pressed um, to extract any juice from the fruit itself. Um, with white wine, they remove the skins and the stems pretty early in the process so that the, the juice remains clear. Um, but with red wine, they of course keep the, the skins. That's sort of how wine gets its color. Um, when you cut into a red grape and a green grape, the flesh is sort of all the same. Um, so the only thing that really imparts that color um, and the added sort of flavor of red wine is that grape skin. Um, so they keep that and often sort of age the wine for a little while with the skins still in there before they really drain everything and just get the juice. Um, the second step is fermentation. So yeast is added to the juice of the, the grape, um, turning any of that natural sugar. So really like think about like Welch's grape juice and then you add yeast. Um, it turns any of the sugar that's in the grape juice into alcohol, um, which is how you get uh, an alcoholic beverage. That's the good stuff in there. Um, and then you take anything that they've produced, um, they'll filter it and lay it to age, whether it's in a cask, as you might've seen, like a big wooden barrel um, or a, a tank, often white wine is aged in like a stainless steel vessel. Um, and then depending on the winemaker's preference, that sort of liquid is then um, bottled and aged again, depending on you know how long they want it to stay on their premises before um, they release it to the public. Often it's like, takes a few months to a year before they'll do a big release of last year's product. The only caveat to this process is one added step for sparkling wine. Since it's the holidays, I figured I would touch on it. What, what better occasion than um, bringing families together and celebrating the holidays, especially New Year's Eve, tends to be a big moment for sparkling wine. Um, sparkling wine undergoes a secondary fermentation, usually in the bottle in which it's been sort of finally, its final product sort of lives. Um, and that process then produces excess carbon dioxide, which is what makes it, um, sparkling. Uh, there are three main methods to sort of achieve that outcome. The first is the champagne or traditional method named after the champagne region of France. Um, that sort of that traditional in the bottle, they add a small, do they call it a dosage, a very small dose of yeast to the bottle itself, which then sort of undergoes this fermentation on a really small scale. That's obviously very labor intensive. You have to do it to each bottle and then often turn the bottles every so often so that the yeast is fully dissolved within the wine. You don't want your wine to taste like a loaf of bread. Um, the second method is the Charmotte or tank method. Same thing, just on a slightly larger format. So it's a stainless steel tank often that the wine will then sort of be at, the yeast will be added to the wine. They'll sort of stir it around and then put it in bottles so that it's still undergoing that secondary fermentation, still sort of a live product. Um, and they'll cork it and put that cage on it so that it doesn't just like explode on its own under pressure. Um, but it's a slightly more scaled way of doing the same exact thing that they do in the bottle. And then the third is just carbonation. So often some of the lower end wines, um, the, they'll do it just like they would soda. So they'll take like a flat wine, inject it with carbon dioxide, cork it and call it a sparkling wine. Um, so it's sort of a, a low cost way of doing it without that sort of added layer of the yeast, um, but sort of develops the same outcome at a, at a much lower price point. 
Um, and then there are a few different flavors of sparkling wine, depending on your preferences. Things go from sweet to dry. Um, in the wine world, dry is often used to describe a lack of residual sugar. It doesn't actually mean that it's drying on the palate or that it has a dry flavor. Um, it's just that it, it doesn't have any residual sugar in the actual juice. Um, it's all been fermented to alcohol. And then um, that sort of in wine language, sweet is translated as brute. Uh, it then goes to extra brute. And then you might see on a bottle that something is in fact dry, especially in a varietal uh, like a sparkling wine or Riesling often comes in both a sweet or a dry version. And then on to tasting, which I know hopefully people are doing on their own already. Uh, if you are, please feel free to write in the chat um, if you've been uh, tasting anything that you're thoroughly enjoying tonight, share with the class. Um, a few sort of tasting mechanics that, you know, sommeliers are trained to do, but, but are also just sort of helpful in thinking about what you might be experiencing on your palate when you try a new wine. Um, so on the left is the, the de deductive, sorry, tasting format. It's basically a, a syllabus or a, you know, a chart that you can walk through as you're trying wines to get a sense of what you're experiencing in a pretty, um, you know, it's a good methodology, a good framework for thinking about flavor. Um, so you'll see it goes basically through the, the five senses. First, um, you want to swirl your wine see what the alcohol content looks like by looking at the legs or the tiers. So when you swirl your wine, you might see a rim form around the glass. Um, the shorter that it takes for that rim to come all the way back down to the liquid, um, the longer, uh, the, the more alcohol in the wine. Um, so the heavier the tiers, the, um, the higher in alcohol content the wine is. Um, so something to keep in mind, if you're drinking something that's, you know, closer to 17%, you'll see those tears stay really long. If you're drinking like a nice light white wine, something like 11, 12% alcohol, uh, they should sort of fall much faster. The second is sight. So what color is the wine? Is it bright? Is it a vibrant color? Uh, is it clear or maybe a little foggy? Sometimes sight is a good way to see if there might be any, um, you know, anything that happened to the wine since it was in the bottle. Sometimes you can tell if the cork was rotten or if there was sort of a defect that affected the, the, that bottle specifically. One in 10 bottles tend to be affected by something called cork rot, where cork is another living product that with wine um, sort of becomes packaging. And so um, sometimes the cork doesn't do its job. It doesn't seal properly, um, in which case you might notice something like foggy or milky in your wine. That's not a good thing and a, a very good reason to return your wine. Um, so if that's ever happened to you at a restaurant or at a liquor store, feel free to complain. That's not uh, uncommon, but uh, a good thing to know to look out for. The third thing to look for is smell. So you can swirl your glass and then stick your nose right in it. Um, see what you get on your on your nose. Um, often this is a good way to figure out if it's an old new, old world wine or a new world wine, which is something we're going to talk about, I think, in a few minutes. Um, but does what's the first smell that hits your nose? Is it earthy? Is it fruity? Um, does it smell like overly alcoholic? These are all good things to sort of take note of as you're walking through your sensory experience. Um, you can also generally get a sense of how old the wine might be. Um, if it's a little mustier, maybe it needs to be oxygenated. Um, and maybe some oak might be available on the nose if, if the wine has been aged. Um, fourth is sip, the best part of the experience. Um, you get to understand if the wine is balanced. Is there a flavor that might be um, coming through more disproportionately than another? Um, is there acid? So um, when a wine is really acidic, you tend to feel it in your salivary glands, like underneath your jaw. Um, if your salivary glands are firing, ten it tends to be a more acidic wine. Um, and then tannins are another sort of more sensory palate experience. If, they, if your tongue feels really dry or tight, um, that tends to be related to tannins primarily in red wine, um, but sometimes rarely in, in an aged white or a really old white wine. Um, and then finally, swallow. 
How long does the flavor last on your palate? Um, and how does it interact with the food you might be eating? Sometimes wine flavors can really come out with certain flavors of food, like cheese and crackers. That's why they tend to do a little bit of a pairing of the two. Um, but sometimes you get a really unique flavor of the wine on its own. Um, so it's interesting to get to sort of compare and contrast that as well. Um, and those are all, all the different ways that you can experience wine. As I said, um, two really interesting ways to sort of differentiate the wine flavor and the wine experience is sort of in combination with the terroir and the sensory experience. So where is the wine from tends to define, you know, what flavor characteristics are in it. And then you can take the flavor characteristics that you are experiencing and try to do a little bit of a deductive work on it on your own too. So um, one of the big distinctions tends to be old world versus new world. In wine, the old world is really just continental Europe where the original vines were farmed. Um, that's places like France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, um, really the creators of the wine that we know. Um, and then as sort of Europe expanded and, um, you know, co colonized other places, America included, uh, they brought with them grapes, uh, primarily for the church. Um, and so the, the existing grape varietal actually spread, they made clones of it, um, replanted it. And that's sort of the wine that we have here today and, and everywhere else in the world. Um, and that's considered the new world of wine. So that's the U S Australia, South Africa, South America, really anywhere that's not continental Europe. It's a pretty clear distinction. Um, and these are descendants, as I said, from the original vines, uh, and the flavor profiles of the two tend to be pretty different just based on the style that winemakers want to produce within those markets. So um, in uh, the old world, they tend to be really earth forward, very herbal, mossy, dirt. There might be like a gravel flavor, especially on the nose. It's really the first thing that you smell is like an earthy flavor, uh, maybe like mushroom, depending on what the, the grape varietal is. Whereas in the new world, it tends to be much fruitier, um, a lot sort of more sugary, that sort of sweeter flavor, really bold, more syrupy flavors. Um, and it makes some sense, you know, America, we have a lot of different foods, a lot of unique flavor, uh, and the wines sort of are designed to pair with those foods um, and really sort of stand up to our diverse diet. Um, and then old world wines tend to be designed to age for a long period of time. They're, they have a culture of cellaring. Most people's homes have, you know, like garages or storage facilities, basements, uh, things, think about like these really old chateaus in France uh, that have these cellars underneath them. Um, they're, they're just used to that. Whereas here, you know, I used to live in a New York City apartment. I currently live, I'm in grad school. I live in a dorm room. Um, so I do not have an active wine cellar uh, or places to store all this wine. So it's more of like, I go to the store, I get what I want for that day. Um, and, you know, it's drank over the course of a couple of days or a week, and then it's on to the next adventure. Uh, and it means that the wine at the store should be ready to drink when I pick it up. Um, and so that's really how the American market operates. Um, and a lot of places in the new world are similar in that they don't release the wine to the retailers until they're ready to drink. So sometimes winemakers will actually use their own cellar space to store wine until they feel that that vintage is ready to drink, um, which is why at a store you might see something from, you know, 2017, 2018 that has never hit the shelves before. It's just been waiting until it was appropriate for it to, to be cracked open. Um, and then the final thing that really makes the differentiator pretty across the board um, and really is like the core difference, I would say, that is pervasive in all the other elements that are different is really the regulation. So in the old world, especially in France and Italy, there's a lot of regulation from the government around what can and can't be um, labeled or sold as X grape or as from which region um, because their economy is so closely tied in many ways to grape and wine production, they really uh, hold close to the chest a lot of the sort of um, rules and they they want to sort of uphold that sort of old school mentality. Uh, and so in France, especially as an example, um, with champagne, anything called champagne has to be from the champagne region. 
of France. Um, you can't call anything not from there champagne, or you'll face like a big fine and a whole legal suit, um, which no one wants. Running a winery is expensive enough. So um, people tend to follow those rules, but there's also many that apply just to the people um, who are making wine stuff, such as, uh, you know, in, in many places in France, they're not allowed to irrigate. Uh, they're not allowed to use chemicals or pesticides to protect their grapes um, from mold or uh, other pests. Um, and so they come up with some creative solutions, which is interesting. Many times they'll plant rose bushes at the end of um, vineyard rows, not to just make the wine smell or taste like roses, um, but actually to attract bugs um, so that they leave the grapes alone. Uh, I visited a vineyard uh, in France that was playing music for their grapes um, in an effort to help them grow. So they they really get creative within the regulations that they have, um, but most of those things don't apply in the new world. Um, so often in the U.S., you might pick up like a Cabernet Sauvignon that uh, on the label says Cab Sauv. You you're, you think you're getting 100% Cab. It really only needs to be 80%. So you're getting 20% of a blend from the, the winemaker who can sort of mix and match what they have on, on hand um, to build that sort of ideal flavor profile. Whereas in France, man, any region that says um, Cabernet Sauvignon, it has to be 100% Cabernet, uh, which is often why you might get more of a Bordeaux style blend. Um, they have to call it a blend if it's more than, a if it's less than 100% of one grape. Um, so there's just some things that become a little more nuanced um, which is a really interesting comparison to do at home if you are feeling adventurous on, you know, a weeknight that you're looking for an activity, um, pick up two wines of the same grape or similar from different regions and, and see if you can get a sense of the older New World styles. Um, and then one of the other things I'll say about um, the experiencing of wine is that there's really no right or wrong flavor, um, much as most people probably experience colors differently or um, food differently. Some people like things that other people don't like. The same applies to wine. So I might say, oh, this wine really tastes like, you know, cherry or pomegranate or, um, you know, I'm getting a buttery flavor. Um, someone else might think that's totally wrong. I'm getting you know, lilacs and uh, fig. Um, so there's a whole aroma wheel to help you sort of ground any of the flavors that you might be experiencing. Sometimes it's that feeling of like, you don't know it until you see the name in front of you. Uh, so if I tell you as you're tasting wine that something tastes like that, chances are you're going to agree with me. Um, but often you're experiencing something that is unique to you. So it's really important. My, my only, um, sort of mandate with tasting wine is really just to try a lot of different things and figure out what you like, because chances are it's very different than um, someone you might be drinking with or what a sommelier would recommend. So um, trying a lot of things helps you figure out what you like, and then also helps a sommelier or someone in a restaurant recommend something that you might like based on what you already like. Um, as I said, when we were talking about the old and new world wines, um, the new world tends to be more fruit forward, um, the old a little more earthy, and some of those flavors, you can go through the aroma wheel um, to sort of ground what, what you're experiencing. So in the earth forward flavors, I think I can see red beet, slate, um, wet gravel. Um, in the sommelier documentary that I mentioned at the beginning, the psalms really like go around and lick rocks. They'll smell tennis balls. Uh, fresh garden hose is a quote they use. Um, you can really say that wine smells or tastes like whatever it is that you want. Um, no one can tell you that you're wrong. So get creative with it. It's a pretty fun activity or exercise to come up with lots of different things in the aroma wheel and try to find them in your wine. A few flavor profiles. And I see we have one question. Maybe now's a good time to take Kathy's question about using a soda stream uh, on wine, would that work to create a cheap sparkling wine? Honestly, it should. I haven't tried it um, personally, but it's a, the same process that a lot of like, like if you've ever had Andre or one of those super cheap 
um, champagnes or sparkling wines. That's really what they do just at mass scale. So in the same way that like you're making, you can make your own soda at home. I really can't see why it wouldn't apply to making your own sparkling wine. Um, so give it a shot. I'd be curious to see how it goes. Um, and then when shopping, how do you know if a wine needs to be cellared before drinking or which can be drunk right away? Um, that's a great question. I would say there's really no rule. White wines tend to be aged less than red just because they don't have the tannins in them um, from the oak and from being sort of laying in those casks. Um, so red wine tends to be more ageable. Um, it doesn't always mean that it needs to be aged though. Some grapes like a, like a Cab or a Bordeaux style blend, some really big Italian grapes, they tend to do well under um, aging and they just like the, really what happens during the aging process is that the tannins break down. So when you put the wine in the bottle, it still has a lot of the tannins in it. When you pour out an aged wine, you get that sediment at the bottom. If, if anyone's ever aged, drank some older wine, um, that's really the tannins that are coming out of solution from the wine liquid um, over time. And as those break down, the flavor just becomes a little softer, a little more delicate. Um, when you drink a younger wine that could with like stand some age, um, it'll just be really drying on your palate. Like that tannic feeling that I described, you might feel like your, your mouth is really tight. You want to drink a lot of water, maybe some white wine in between. Um, and your, your tongue might get like really purple. Um, that's from tannins. Uh, and so I would say, depending on the grape varietal, where the white wine is from, um, some cabs can hold up to like 25 years of age. Um, and so sometimes it's a fun experiment to age some or, and then buy the same thing new and you can taste what, you know, what age does to, to wine. But most of the time, if it's on the shelf, it doesn't need to be aged. Um, especially here, sometimes it just gets a little bit better with time. It's like all those birthday cards that are like wine, cheese, and you, we all get better with time kind of things. <laughs> So there's really no rule to it. I wish that there were like a magic app. You could scan the wine and say like, is this good to drink yet? Um, but I haven't seen anyone come out with that yet. So maybe a business idea. A few flavor profiles. Um, and again, please write in the chat. If you have a favorite, we can focus on that or talk, speak a little bit specifically to any top picks of those who are joining today. Um, but a few white wine flavors that will sort of help you ground your description or understanding of the flavor profiles in your wine, um, white wine and red too tend to be divided into the same categories of every other food, sweet and savory. Um, the sweet white wines will be what wine people will call fruit forward, uh, is really a, a nice way to say that it's sweeter. Um, with white wine, those fruits tend to be more citrus. So something like, uh, you know, lemon, uh, orange, you might get like a honeysuckle tends to be associated with sweeter flavors, um, some floral notes. Um, they might also call sweeter wine off dry. That tends to mean that it does have a little bit of residual sugar. If you're curious about that, you could do, again, sort of a side-by-side -side specifically of Riesling. There tends to be a lot of off-dry and dry varietals, so it's sort of fun to compare. If you go to any wine store, they should be able to point you in that direction. Um, and a couple of other sort of sweeter flavors for white wine, honey, as I said, apple, pear, um, those are all flavors that could be more tart, but could also sort of hold more of a sugary flavor. Um, and then on the savory side, you get more of that earthy and oaky flavor, especially something like a Chardonnay or an older world uh, Sauvignon Blanc perhaps could have more of an herbaceous flavor. Um, Sauvignon Blanc tends to taste exactly to me, at least like passion fruit, which turns out is like one of those cilantro flavors that people either love or hate. It's like a genetic predisposition. Um, so some people love it. Some people cannot stand the smell or taste. Um, and then another sort of polarizing wine flavor is Chardonnay, especially aged or oaked Chardonnay. Uh, it has that really sort of buttery dairy flavor. And that's actually because it, if it, if white wine tends to be 
um, oaked, it has like a secondary reaction called a malolactic fermentation. And it creates this really buttery dairy flavor in the wine. Some winemakers do it on purpose, especially new world Chardonnays. Um, whereas old world tends to be unoaked, in which case Chardonnay is actually a neutral grape. So it won't have any flavor other than just classic white wine. Uh, as I mentioned, a couple of common varietals, but there are plenty more. Chardonnay, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling, Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio, same grape, just different places. Pinot Grigio is Italian. Pinot Gris is French. Um, and Pinot Gris tends to be maybe a little bit sweeter, but just based on the style and the terroir, as we talked about. And then similar for red wine, we have sweet and savory. Uh, the sweet, again, fruit forward. These tend to be more um, red or black berries, stone fruit, things like plum, cherry, really common in red wine. Um, and then on the savory side, you have that sort of dry or tannic mouthfeel, as we discussed, um, and some earthy, oakier, like you might get dirt or leather or meat. Um, some people get tobacco. It just depends on the grape varietal. Um, and then one of my favorite grapes, Cabernet Franc, smells exactly, at least to me, like bell pepper. So the wines can have a really interesting vegetal quality too. Um, and a couple of common varietals, uh, Pinot Noir, which is a, a lighter red, red wine, um, Cabernet Franc, which is pretty classically blended, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, Merlot. If anyone has any other favorites, again, feel free to post them in the chat. And I see Linda asked about aeration tools. Um, I do think that they work. Um, there's one that I'm completely forgetting the name of that's wonderful, especially if you drink like one glass of wine a night and you don't want to open the entire bottle and sort of oxygenate it and risk sort of wasting some of it that might go bad. It allows you to sort of permeate the cork and only aerate one glass at a time. Um, so that's sort of a fun one. And then um, decanters are great if you're drinking something that's really aged. It just continues to expose the wine to more and more oxygen, which is really what sort of helps um, make the, the wine that's, if you think of wine, as I said, it's really a living product. So it needs to sort of be exposed to oxygen to really come back to life after being stuck in a bottle for a really long time. Uh, so the more you can expose it to air, the more it sort of opens up and you can experience more of the flavor that have been sort of stuck inside the bottle. Um, so decanting is good for oxygenating. That's why people swirl their glass a lot. It's really to infuse oxygen into the wine. It's also why some of the big red wine glasses are like really wide and open. Um, it's just to continue to expose the wine to oxygen. Um, and Linda loves Sangiovese and Syrah, which are two great red wine grapes. Syrah is the same thing as Shiraz. If anyone drinks Australian wine, um, another great opportunity to try two comparative um, wines from Old and New World. Syrah is more of a French version of the same grape, um, very different style, but, um, and compare it to a, to an Australian Shiraz. And then a couple of pairing, not rules, I guess is the wrong, the wrong way to put it, but things to think about as you're maybe preparing a meal and want to pair um, a wine with it. Um, and these are, again, just sort of guidelines that are sort of helpful to have in the back of your mind. Um, one is that like things just go together. So salty food with a high salinity wine, a really good example of this is, I don't know if people like oysters, but oysters are really salty. They taste a lot like the ocean where they live. Um, and they tend to go really well with a Chablis, which is sort of a high salinity coastal French, uh, red, uh, white wine. So that's sort of a nice, you know, thinking through like flavors go together, um, in the same vein, things that are grown together go together. So, you know, an Italian uh, Sangiovese, let's say, to use Linda's example, might go really well with pizza or a red sauce pasta dish. Um, the, the cuisine is also tended, tends to have been grown from the same soil and the same, um, you know, earth as the wine too. So, um, you know, right next door to each other, you might have San Marzano tomatoes growing next to Sangiovese grapes. It makes sense that if they can grow together, they might taste good together too. Um, opposites also work. So in the opposite of like with like, this is the opposites attract. 
Um, sometimes spicy food can pair really well with a sweeter wine, something like an off dry Riesling and a Thai curry dish, for example. And then, um, sweet foods tend to go well with a salty wine. So, um, that's sort of why, uh, you know, like, uh, like cheese and if, a, or a cheese goes really well with like a dessert wine, for example, um, and then on the, to flip that something like a Chablis, as I said, sort of more of that salty flavor might go really nicely with like a cheesecake or something that has sort of a richness that the salt can really play into. And then the final one, and I think this is actually the most important is really just balance. So if you're having a really heavy food, something hearty, something with a lot of flavor, you need a heavy wine to really stand up to that. Um, and the same vice versa, like a, a really light food dish, like, you know, pasta with, um, with white wine sauce, for example, if you drink it with like a really heavy Cabernet Sauvignon, you're not going to taste any of the food that you spent so long cooking. You're just going to taste the Cabernet. Um, so it's important to sort of bring the two together, really highlight them, um, because you want to taste the wine and you want to taste the food. And if you can get the pairing right, they actually both taste better together. I see one question. Um, someone likes a Zinfandel, red only though. Zinfandel is a great uh, full bodied red wine. There is a white Zinfandel variety, which tends to be a really sort of sweet uh, rose. Um, but I agree with, with the attendee Zinfandel red only, but that's just my opinion. And then a couple of fun pairings since we're going into the holidays. Um, for those who celebrate Hanukkah, latkes tend to go really well with a sparkling wine, that sort of high fat potato, um, French fries and champagne tend to go really well. Popcorn and champagne tend to go really well. Um, so I would advise sort of a bubbly um, component with sort of a latke um, meal. Uh, New Year's Eve, again, another great opportunity for sparkling wine. If you're looking for something a little different, especially if it's a super cold night, I actually love sparkling red wine. So um, you can find a sparkling Lambrusco or a sparkling Shiraz tend to be really the only two um, that are really readily accessible. Um, a Shiraz is going to be a, a heavier, sort of definitely a darker pigmented color. And Lambrusco could tend more towards like a rosé, um, but a, a really nice opportunity to try something new. Most wine stores have one of the other. Um, so give it a shot, see if it's something that you might like. Uh, it's also really great transitionally, see, like for a season. So, um, you know, early fall or late spring or early spring when you might be ready to sort of switch from traditionally white wine or red wine to the other, um, a sparkling red can be a really nice way to do that. Um, for those who might be overwhelmed with cooking around the holidays, especially we just had Thanksgiving and you might be ordering takeout. Um, things, as I mentioned, that go with, you know, your typical Chinese food or Thai food, Indian might be an off dry Riesling, something with a little bit of sugar tends to really hold up nicely with a spicier, really flavorful dish. Um, a Sancerre, which is a French Sauvignon Blanc, um, or a Gewurz Traminer is also, um, a really nice sort of fruit forward white wine, um, that can really hold up to some of those more takeout type of flavors. Um, or if you're getting adventurous and you're making some of that kind of food yourself, another great way to sort of highlight those flavors. And then with dessert, um, port tends to go really nicely with pie. Pie has more of like a fruit base, obviously, um, and port can really bring out that sort of caramelized flavor in the, in the pie. Apple's my favorite. So, um, port tends to go really well with a nice apple pie. And then, I really like Sauterne with more of like a chocolate dish. Sauterne, especially when it's really cold, um, is just really refreshing. And it has sort of a sweet aftertaste um, that pairs really nicely with like a chocolate mousse or a chocolate cake. Um, so just a few ideas for those who are cooking for the holidays or not cooking for the holidays and want to bring something uh, to friends or family or just drink when you're having your takeout. No right way to celebrate. Um and with that, I'll open it up to questions. I already see one or two in the chat. Um, one about red ice wines. Um, my guess there, it's, it's a totally fair question, actually, one I've never been asked. Uh, so props to Kathy for a fresh new question. Um, I would say my guess is that 
uh, because ice wine is actually the grapes have been frozen when they pick them, um, that they don't want the skins in there. Like they just want to get rid of them right away. And because the skin is what gives the wine color, I would guess that like the skin is so cold or like the cold sort of removes it of its like quality of the tannins or of, um, its flavor or that they just don't want to like age it very long. And sometimes something that's aged might need, uh, or something that has the skins might need more aging time and ice wine just might not stand up to that. Um, but it's a great question. I like ice wine isn't something I come across all that, that often. So it's something I should do more reading up on, but I'll have to stop at the library. <laughs> um, talking about prices, for example, if, um, if bottles of Pinot Grigio range from seven to 27, will the more expensive bottle always be better? Someone said to go with a mid price or above good advice. What goes into the price of a wine? That's a really great question. Um, I would say like there's great wine. That's really inexpensive. It's just a matter of knowing how to pick out quality, uh, versus just like the big name labels. Often the more wine, a wine maker produces. So like the more sort of like big box, the winery, let's call it, um, the cheaper the wine can be. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's lower in quality. It just means that the winery sort of has more margin around like their fixed costs. So a lot of the costs of making wine, like the bottling process, the, you know, labor of farming, like those kinds of things are sort of stable regardless of how much you're producing. So some of the smaller, more family run small business type wineries have a lot more costs to recoup in fewer bottles of, that they produce. Um, so that's why they tend to charge more um, just because they, they need to make back the money with fewer bottles to sell, if that makes sense. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily that cheaper wine is worse. It's just that it might not be as like close to the land, if that makes sense. Like these bigger wineries can really like make very consistent output. Um, so that year over year, like the, um, what's a good example, like the cupcake Sauvignon Blanc or something that you see in the, in the store, um, that will taste the same pretty much year over year because they can guarantee that they'll have enough grapes to really like make it consistent. Um, and it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's maybe not as um, like homegrown or high touch, for example. So I would say like, uh, you know, 15, $12 is a pretty safe spot. Like I too tend to doubt like, why is it only $7? Um, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that they probably either like can make money with other wines. Sometimes wineries might make a red and a white and they're red, they can charge a lot more. Maybe it's a higher quality or there's higher demand for that product versus the white maybe is just sort of a supplemental good and they can, they just want to get rid of whatever they've produced at break even cost. So some of the pricing has to do with economics of the wineries specifically and how they're structured, who owns them. Um, but I would say generally like the more family run smaller production wineries tend to be on the higher end and the wineries that have um, sort of more mass market tend to be on the lower end. Um, and a lot of it has to do with marketing too. You know, what's the brand name? Something like Veuve Clicquot, for example, people say is actually really bad wine. They just have the label that can stand up to charging 50 bucks a bottle. Um, could I talk about orange wine? Definitely. Um, orange wine is sort of a new trendy wine it tends to fall into the category of like natural or biodynamic wine. I'm really into it. Um, some people think it's really gross, uh, but I think it depends on, again on your palate. Um, I would say if you like like a sweeter, more fruit forward wine, orange wine might not be for you. It tends to have sort of more of a, an earthy, um, almost like an a hard cider, like a really dry, hard cider, uh, definitely like a cloudier look. Um, orange wine is actually white wine that has had contact with the skins. Um, so it's like the color of the white grape and the flavor of the white grape skins is what makes it orange. Whereas rosé is red wine that has had little contact with the skin. So it just gives it that little blush color. Um, and I would say for pairing orange wines, I would go with the sort of 
um, grows together, goes together mentality of oftentimes orange wines are from like more Mediterranean or Eastern European countries or California really. And I would try to go with like a really amazing vegetable meal or like a fresh fish or something that really complements the place in which the wine was made. Um, because in, or, while orange wines are just gaining popularity, they really have been around like for since ancient times. Um, and so I would, I would say like going with, um, maybe what's more traditional around an orange wine could really help bring out the flavor. Um, Ben said he is intimidated by the sheer variety when walking into a liquor store. Totally fair. Do you have any tips on how to narrow the gaze? Definitely. Um, first I would say it depends if you are excited to try something new or if you want to go with what you, your good, you know, old classics. Um, I would say if you're looking for something new, an easy way, most wine stores tend to be organized by region. So I would go for like a region that you've never tried before, somewhere that just you're curious about, maybe Portugal or Spain, somewhere that's a little less sort of out of the box traditional, especially if you're used to drinking like American wine or French wine, some of the more, um, populated aisles, um, find some sort of a smaller region and, and just go for something that looks interesting. Um, and a, another really good way is obviously to narrow down by price. As we were discussing, wine can range from $7 to like $700. So don't break the bank on something. There's plenty of amazing high quality wines at any price point across any region. Um, and then I would say my other tip for narrowing down is like use the guidance of the people who work there because they really know their inventory the best. Um, and if you're able to speak to something that you already know you like, for example, if your go-to is a Californian Chardonnay and you said, you know, I really like Californian Chardonnays. I usually buy this bottle for $17. I'm really interested in trying something different, but that seems, you know, on par with my budget and with some of my preferences. Is there something you could recommend? They would know exactly where to point you. Um, whereas, you know, you might say, you know, I like this, but I have no idea what what's similar or what's out there. Um, wine takes a lot of expertise. Uh, and I would say in, in that sort of lens, like trust the experts and take the free education from the people who work in the store um, because they often know like really cool stories and niche fun facts about wine producers. And yes, some of it is them selling you on the wine, um, but the other side of it is really cool to then understand a little bit more about the people who produced the product that you then get to consume. It's one of the reasons that I loved wine or fell in love with, with wine in the first place is um, wine tends to be an industry of passion. People say that uh, wine is a really, if you're, if you have a million dollars and own a winery, it's a really good way to lose a million dollars. Um, it's not an industry most people go into to make money. Um, but it tends to be a lot of people who are just really passionate about it, passionate about their product, about their land, about their farming techniques, uh, and about their stories. A lot of people have family heritage or, um, really interesting connections to the wine world. And oftentimes those stories are, um, kept, you know, close to the chest sometimes, but, but often they get sort of translated from, you know, winemaker to the person who then imports their wine to the person who then buys it at the, sells it to the retailer and then to the retailer themselves. So there's something really nice about feeling like wine has sort of a heritage or a family component, um, that you then can sort of take pride in consuming. Um, from an attendee, what would be the sweetest sparkling wine you would recommend? It's a great question. I would definitely say, look for something that says on the label Brut, B-R-U-T. Um, that tends to be sweeter, definitely less like tart and apple um, a little bit more sort of honeyed, uh, and sweeter. There are also sweet Lambruscos. I see the next question is about Lambrusco. Um, there are sweet Lambruscos. Um, there are sweet sparkling rosés. Um, anything that says brute though is a pretty pretty easy place to start um, because they have to put on the label 
especially with French sparkling wine, they have to put on the label, the designation of how much residual sugar is left in the liquid. Um, and so that's what brute extra brute or dry means. So brute having the most residual sugar should definitely be the sweetest. Um, someone said they enjoy Lambrusco with Italian food and it doesn't seem as popular. It's, it's sparkling red wines can be hard to find. I feel like um, as natural wines, as orange wines are starting to gain more popularity, some of the, like, there's something called pet nat, which is sort of a natural way of making sparkling wine, um, definitely on the yeastier end of sparklings versus the sweeter end. Um, but that, the, I think Lambrusco, keep an eye out. I think it'll be making a resurgence if I have any prediction of trends in the wine world, um, because I think people are getting more curious about unique wines. And Lambrusco tends to be something that you wouldn't always pick up off the shelf on your own, but that once you try it, you tend to want to buy it again. Um, this is a good question about the point system for different wines. So I, I tend not to buy into points, but they are an interesting way to help differentiate that sort of quality that I've been talking about. So, um, if a wine has, you know, 90 points or something, which is sort of the tipping point when they start to advertise that they have the points and it's, you know, a reasonably priced bottle, like 16, 17, 18, $19, then it's probably a really good value. And so I think that's a place where I tend to notice more of the point system is if it's, let's call it sub $30. Um, once you get above $30, like a lot of the wine should be of high quality. And at that point, the points really tend to be more for marketing and sales than for distinguishing the difference to a consumer. Um, what is an estate wine? Does that mean it's closer to the land? Great question. So an estate wine tends to mean that it was all grown on the premise of the estate. So to answer your closer to the land question, the answer it's sort of a complex sort of, um, I would say yes, in terms of if the land is the like the people who own the winery, then yes, um, all land, all wine is from land. So you've just sort of defined what the land means. Um, but uh, an estate wine means generally that it's grown and bottled on the premise of the place, like the people who own the wine. There are wineries who buy grapes from other wineries or other, um, you know, grape growers who have maybe an over like a surplus of wine. Um, of high quality or that they work with, they partner year over year to sort of buy producers grapes. Um, so those would not be estate wines. The, the estate wines have to be sort of from owned land. There are wines that are $100 plus, what makes it worth it? Um, it's a good question. I would never spend over $100 on a bottle of wine. I think most Somalias would tell you the same thing. The exception being maybe at a restaurant when everything tends to just be super inflated. Um, but at a liquor store, there's no reason to spend over $100. Um, once wines get over $100, it's really just reputation. Um, and at that point, you're buying wine that may be amazing, but it probably like you could find better wine for under $100. Um, something certainly comparable. So I would say be wary of wines that are too expensive. Um, the thing that tends to drive the price is really that quantity that I was talking about. If there are fewer bottles, they can charge more for them, um, especially if the winemaker or the, the, land, the sort of producer has a really strong reputation for putting out high quality wines. Um, but a lot of it is just marketing and branding. Um, my thoughts on organic wines. I think they're great. Um, I appreciate organic wines. I think um, it's certainly a, a trend. We've all realized that putting pesticide in our body is not necessarily a good thing. Um, so I appreciate that that trend is sort of following through the wine industry. Um, and it's, I think it's becoming more pervasive. Some sort of bigger producers are, are sort of taking their time enacting some of the rules, but I think there's some legislation that like within maybe the next five to 10 years, um, wine producers do have to cut down on pesticides just because we know that drinking chemicals is bad. So um, I think it's a great movement um, and it shouldn't really change the output of wine. As I mentioned, when we were talking about old world and new world. 
a lot of like wine producers in France have never been allowed to use pesticides and they have some of the most high quality wines with, you know, that are certainly can get above a hundred dollars a bottle. Um, so it really shouldn't impact the way the wine tastes. Um, it's really just about sometimes there's more natural processes other than, you know, going further than organic, which can have more of an impact on the flavor of the wine, but strictly removing the pesticides should, should just be a, a net positive in my opinion. Um, I'm so glad people are enjoying the presentation. Um, some questions about Greek wines. Um, Greek, Greece is definitely another region that I really want to explore from a wine standpoint. Um, I don't know that I've ever had Restina, so I would love to know what you think of it. Um, but I, I can't comment because I've never tried it. So I'll add it to my list. I've had a lot of Assyrtiko, which I really like, which is a, a white wine. Um, definitely more on the, the um, dry side, a little bit more herbaceous, earthy than some of the more um, common grapes, but it's really fun to try. And Greek also Greece also produces a lot of great orange wines. So if that's something you're interested in trying, that could be a region worth asking about. Um, why isn't extra brute the sweetest for um, sparkling wine? That's a great question. It should be um, but it's not, <laughs> uh, the way that they made the distinction is just brute, extra brute and dry. Um, I think it must've been something that got lost in translation, but, uh, I don't know. It's just the way it is. Sometimes you just got to raise your hands with the wine people and say, how did you come up with this? Because none of it makes sense, but you know, back in the day. Um, typical, typical percent markup on wine at a restaurant is an astounding, like 80%, 75%. It's crazy. Um, I don't know if anyone uses the app Vivino. It's a really nice, uh, wine app. They basically allow you to take a picture of any bottle of wine. They'll scan it into their system and they'll tell you what you can pay for it at a retail store. Um, use it caution with caution at a restaurant because, when you uh, scan the bottle of wine that they've brought to your table and they've opened for you and you realize that you could buy it at a store for $13 and you're paying, you know, 70, you're going to be sad. Um, but if it's a really great wine, that's, you know, sometimes the trade-off. The app also has a really awesome feature where it will scan a wine list for you and it will let you know, like, what wines you might like based on your usage of the app and your history um, or what might be a good deal. So that's sort of a fun feature too. Um, but yeah, restaurants make most of their money on alcohol. So they really upcharge you on the wine. Um, should we be concerned about sulfites? No, sulfites are in most things. Uh, anything preserved has a sulfite. Generally, there are no or low sulfite wines. People like have a theory that the fewer sulfites, the less of a hangover, which could be true. Um, but it goes back to that sort of like organic methodology. Um, sulfites are just a preservative. So wines that are designed to age longer, like red wines tend to have a higher sulfite quantity or more preservatives. That's why some people feel like they get more of a headache drinking red wine if they're more sensitive to sulfites. Um, if it's, if it's not something that bothers you, it, you should be fine. There are like little can add like drops or there's like wand products I've seen online um, that people use to try to reduce the amount of sulfites or lessen them. I, I don't understand the chemistry, um, but uh, generally like if you've ever eaten potato chips or something, there's sulfites in, in most things that are like shelf stable. So it's really just used because as I said, wine is a living product. Um, and so they, they use it to stabilize a lot of those natural wines that we've been talking about don't have sulfites, uh, hence the natural, but, um, they're also less shelf stable and they tend to be a little more finicky. So, um, if you're looking for something to age or that you're drinking something that has been aged, chances are you're drinking sulfites. Um, with all the regulation they face, are old world wines organic? Um, many of them are. So a lot of wines from France are organic. Uh, I don't know as much about the regulations in Italy, but there, like, there are a lot of regulations around land restrictions. So um, to call something like an AOC, 
or uh, a DOC, they call it in Italy, a DOCG are sort of these levels of distinction of the wine for something to be classified as with like within those levels of distinction, they have to abide by a bunch of rules. And I wouldn't be surprised if one of them was no pesticides. Um, it's certainly the case in France. They're really strict, um, especially like I visited France during a drought and the grapes would have loved some water, uh, but they're not allowed to irrigate. So no water for them. Uh, but chances are like a lot of the old world wineries just have a lot more restriction in order to sort of keep the number of wineries that are producing at those high levels down. Um, because otherwise everyone would be calling themselves like the highest caliber of Barolo or of um, Champagne or of Burgundy. And uh, you wouldn't be able to tell what was like really, really good and of that super high quality land uh, or what was blended from around the entire country of France and beyond. So, um, and then I think this might be our last question, but um, people, maybe wine people drink a bunch of extra brut when deciding, <laughs> that's a fun comment, um, when deciding on brut versus extra brut, uh, Kathy said maybe the wine people drink a bunch of wine, which maybe they did. Chances are they did. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, my email is on um, the screen. I can put it in the chat too, um, or shoot me a note on my website. I'm more than happy to talk about wine forever and ever and ever. Um, and I really appreciate you joining us tonight. Well, we really appreciate all the time you gave us and and answering all of those questions. I'm so excited that people were so curious about wine tonight. That's great. Um, okay. And just re just really quick, a clarification: the the app was Vivino. Yes, that right? I can. I'll write it in the chat. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that looks um, it's pretty well rated, so it yeah. looks like a good app to have. Um, going shopping for wine. Yeah. Well, anyway. Thank you so much, Jillian. This was wonderful. I hope you're all going to enjoy a uh, wonderful wine this holiday season and going forward. I hope everybody learned a whole lot. I'm going to be sending out the recording um, tomorrow um, so everyone can rewatch and review all of the awesome, excellent information that Jillian gave us tonight. Thank you all Thank so, you much. so much. Thanks for joining and for all the questions. Have a great night, everyone.